I, like many of you, as a, a kid growing up, I came to a certain age where my parents began to leave me at home by myself. Does anyone remember that? If you all remember, maybe you lived with parents. Certainly every one of us had that experience. Maybe some of us younger than others. Maybe some of us had overprotective parents. Mine were a little bit overprotective, so I was probably a little older when they started doing this, but they had to out of necessity. I had a younger brother, so they had to do certain things. So they'd have to leave me at home and when it started out, it would be real quick, like, okay, we're going to be going to the grocery store or go to the bank. We'll be right back. So you just stay here by yourself. And then as time went on, I would graduate maybe, and they would be gone a little longer. They'd say, well, we're going to be gone for a couple of hours. You're going to have to take care of lunch, or you might have to do some dinner, something like that. And as I got a little older, maybe they would leave a $20 bill on the countertop and say, okay. I want you to do some laundry, clean your room, and uh, if you could, take my car. You can take the car out, get you something to eat, but if you don't mind, wash it, get it cleaned up by the time we come back, and things will be great. So it was a wonderful experience. We all went through it. We all go through it. Maybe parents are starting to do this a little bit themselves, but it's a very scary time too, isn't it? Because it starts out real innocent, like, hey, we're going to the bank. We'll be right back. And then it gets a little more serious. We're going to be gone for a couple of hours. You're going to have to make yourself some food. We hope the room's cleaned up when we come back. And, you know, we'll see how that goes. And then it becomes, well, we're going to be gone for four or five hours. And you sit around and you think, huh, well, I could get my bike and I could go down to my friend's house. And maybe some of our friends will be there. We could play. We could have a, a game of football or a pickup game of, of baseball. And something may happen there. And we wonder... What will occur in this type of a situation? We wonder, will we be able to pass under mom and dad's eyes of what they'll know? Maybe someone brings something that we know that we shouldn't take or use or play with, and yet we feel tempted to do that. And we think, well, they'll be home for, it'll be a couple, three more hours. Maybe I could cover up or hide. It's kind of a dangerous time. Our parents they, uh, they give us a little bit of leeway and they want to see how far we'll go. And I learned something in that experience that regardless of what I did, mom and dad, they always seemed to do everything that I did when they were gone, whether good, bad, or otherwise. They always seemed to know. How did they know? How did they know that I did these things? I, I, I just can't understand it, but you couldn't keep any secrets from my parents. And I'm sure your parents either, right? Well, how much of our life of faith is like that? How much of the life that we live in faith is this bit of God letting us go a little bit further each time, giving us a little more freedom, a, a little more leeway to, to see how we will respond? I think much of our lives in faith is that way. I think that God does give us freedom gives us chance and choices to make and, and sees how we will respond before we get more opportunities. The audience of James is dealing with this and they're dealing with this question. God, do you see what we're doing? Do you hear us? Do you know what's going on? Do you care? You understand as we've gone through this book of James and we've seen that these were Christian Jews who were persecuted. They were run out of their, their home city of Jerusalem. They had to flee. They had to scatter. And they found themselves in Corinth and Ephesus and Athens and Thessalonica and places of this type. And while they were there, they had to build new lives. And it was hard for them. And it was as if God was giving them a little more freedom. And James is giving them instruction to try to reel them back, to help them see you're not alone. You're, you are being watched over and cared for God. And they're living among people, you understand, that don't really have an understanding of God. They don't really care that God says, love your neighbor as yourself or love your enemies. They'd never heard that before. They didn't understand that God's spoke to them about giving more than they taking. That was foreign to them. For them, life was something that you indulge and you take what you can. And so the church of James was faced with that 
that God, he like put a $20 bill on the countertop and he said, okay, here you go. Get yourself something to eat and, and take care and use the rest to the best of your ability. And I'll, I'll check on you when I get back. And they're thinking, well, God, are you coming back? Do you care what's happening? Do you see us? Do you care? Do you understand? To those questions, James gives answers. And they're tough answers. And that's what we're talking about today. The answer to that question. First of all, we understand something. And all of these answers, the, the problem with them, we know all of them. We know them like the back of our hand. We know what's, what's going to be said before it's even said. The problem isn't knowing these answers. The problem is, do we believe in them? Do we buy them? That's the burden of this message today a little bit. So the first one is, the day of the Lord is coming. Right? The day of the Lord is coming. And we all nod our heads in affirmation, right? Of course. But do we buy it? We know it. We believe it, right? But do we buy it? Do we really buy it? You see, it's real easy to get sucked into the world that doesn't really believe it or buy it. James's world, they didn't really buy the fact. They, they didn't know who the Lord was in Corinth or in Ephesus. Much less that he's coming back. James's church knew, but the people around them didn't know. And they had no idea what that meant or, or what that there would be a day of reckoning that the Lord would come back and, and bring judgment to the earth, that the Lord would come and want an accounting of what we've done or haven't done. They had no idea. So it was real easy to get sucked in and wrapped into the rest where we understand that these people were busy making money. We talked about that last week, that enticing to go and get, gain wealth and riches and fortune and all of this was burdening them they were wrapped into this concept that if God's coming back you know it's a lot like the teenage girl she is a, a good girl she makes good grades she works hard to make good grades and she tries to do, listen to her parents she does what they want she comes to church she believes she has faith She's a good girl. She has a lot of dreams. She has a lot of hopes. But she also wants to fit in. She wants to have friends. She wants to be liked. She wants to be invited places. And sometimes she is. And she struggles with the people that come to these places. And how do I fit in yet stay true to me? And of course, one night she's invited to a party that has everybody from the school. And she's excited about it. And her parents are comfortable in letting her go. And they feel like now you're going to get a little bit of freedom and enjoy yourself. And she's at the party and she's around her friends and she's trying to fit in. And she's just wrapped up in the moment and she does things she shouldn't do. She does things she knows she's not supposed to do, but she doesn't. Everybody else is doing them. She doesn't. Of course, you wouldn't you know that one of her friends... Has got their phone and videoing everything she does. And by the time she gets home, not only has that friend shared it with all her other friends, but that friend has put it on every social media platform. And mom and dad are saying, You want to talk about what's just happened? She runs to her room, she tears off her clothes, she's devastated. And what burdens her the most is that what does God think? God, what do you think about what's just happened to me? Weep and wail, says James. The day of the Lord is coming. It's coming. Be ready. Don't be caught off guard. Don't get sucked in. Don't get wrapped up. Be ready. The day of the Lord is coming. We know that. Do we buy that? That's the question. God is coming. Jesus is coming. James also tells us that material wealth doesn't last. Again, we hear that and we know that, but do we, do we buy it? Material wealth doesn't last. Materialism doesn't really 
It doesn't last. It, it, it's not going to give you what you're looking for. James uses some very interesting language. He talks about the, the wealth that we enjoy. It says our wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Whoa, James. Easy, buddy. Easy. We get it. It's not going to last, but my goodness. But it doesn't last. We know it doesn't last. We know that the things that we chase, material on this earth, they don't last. And they don't give us what we're looking for, really. Now, we all want to have certain things, right? We want to give our families, our children, certain things material things we need material I mean we need clothes I want to wear a, a nice shirt when I come before you and preach I don't want to be sloppily dressed I want to have my shoes looking good I mean Ben wants to have suit up Sunday and good for him but we know that these material articles are not going to really give us happiness a mom and dad they want to give their son help their son find his first car right and he's worked and he's saved up money to get that first car, right? He's worked really hard. He's got a good little savings, but of course he wants to have a nice car. And mom and dad have sat down and they've been really practical. Mom especially has been really practical and said, okay, here's what we're going to spend. And that's it. No more. Okay, I got it. Got it. So dad goes out with the son and they start looking at cars and dad's the smart one. The son is the 16 year old that's wanting to get the car, right? And, and dad helps him find the cars that are in his price range. But the son likes the other cars better, doesn't he? Of course he does. He likes the shiny red car that just really glistens and it has some really cool rims and it has a really nice stereo. And you know what? A little bit of dad likes that car too. Let's say a lot of dad likes that car, doesn't he? So what does dad do? Oh, we can maybe make that work it out. But son says, well, what about mom? Don't worry about her. Don't worry about mom. We got this. So what do they do? They buy the car and they rev up the engine all the way home and they sit in the, in the driveway for two or three hours. Oh, and dad and son love that radio and they love the music. And dad is just excited as he can be. He's proud of his son. He should be. He loves his son. He wants to help him. And it, it makes him feel the way he felt a little bit. Seems like a long time ago, but maybe it wasn't that long ago. And everything's fine. Mom's not real concerned about it. She may be a little concerned about the price, but it, she didn't know. Are you sure you got it for that deal? He says, don't worry about it. It's a great deal. But anyway, things are fine. Until they're not. The son's out at a football game, and after the game, he goes out with some friends and then he wrecks the car. Thankfully, he's not hurt. Thankfully, he didn't do anything wrong. He just lost control and wrecked the car. 16 year old sons do that. I did it. And then they have to get the car towed. It's not drivable. The car has to be towed home. And then the insurance company has to come check out the car. And then mama finds out how much he paid for the car. You see, material things don't last. And when we place so much value in them, when we place so much of ourselves into material goods, we find ourselves in that state of, now what? Now what? God, do you care? Are you hearing? Do you help us? It's tough. James says it very harshly, but maybe he should. Moths will just eat your clothes. You can pack your closets full, but moths will just run through them. I've got really nice scarves that moths have just riddled. How do they even get in there? Rust will, will destroy anything. You know, gold can't be, it can't, it can't corrode. You know that. James says gold can't corrode, but you know you can grind up gold into powder and it can dissipate. It can be hard to pull together. You can grind it up. Material wealth doesn't last. 
He also says, and we know this too, you can't take it with you. You know that, right? You can't take it with you, but do we buy it? We know this. We know God's coming back. We know material wealth doesn't last, and we know you can't take it with you, but why do we consume so much? Again, the language James uses is is very strong. You have hoarded your wealth in the last days. These last days you have hoarded your wealth. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You've just fattened yourselves like an animal awaiting to be slaughtered, executed, killed, dinner, right? You've just gobbled everything up. And what is it going to get you? Well, nothing. We know it's not going to get us anything, but why do we still do it? Why does Sam, who is a corporate executive, why has he built his life around that American dream? He's a smart guy. He went to a good college, has a, has a programming degree. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. And yet he's gone and he's made his mission in life to be the best, regardless of what it takes. He hadn't made a whole lot of friends in the workplace. Instead, he's done what he can to climb to the top and he has built a life for himself that he's proud of. He doesn't really need the 5,000 square foot house that he lives in, but he sure likes it. He's gotten comfortable in it. It's nice to have some extra rooms. It's nice to drive home and to see the exterior brick lit up at night. It it makes him feel good to look at his grass. And when the sprinklers comes on, he kind of smiles and he thinks, wow, I don't even have to really take care of it. It's, It's neat for someone else to mow his lawn. He loves that his kids... They can now go to the school he always wanted them to go to. The the good school down the street. It costs a little bit extra. A little bit more. But he likes it. And his wife was finally able to quit her job and to stay home and do what she wants to do. He's proud of what he's accomplished. He's proud of it. He likes it. He's filled his life with it. And then when he's about 50 years old, his company sold. And Sam isn't needed anymore. And now what is he going to do? Not everybody's lining up to buy his house. He's going to have to take his kids out of their school. His wife's probably going to have to go back to work. How's she even going to do that? She's been at home for 15 years. That's what happens. We just gobble and we take and we bloat and then we burst. And we say, God, what do we do now? Well, God speaks. God hears us, right? That's what James is saying. That's really his message. God hears everything that we say. God knows everything that we do. God is right there with us. He's been watching all along. He's been listening all along, he's, he's ready. Which is why we know that the way we treat other people matters more than anything else. It's what we do for one another that really matters. Look, says the Lord, the cries have reached the ears of the Lord. Look, the weeping, the wailing is heard by the Lord. Look. The sadness, the despair is heard by God. Look, God knows. God cares. Do we? Do we care? Do we care for each other the way we should? That teenage girl needs to know that God God hears her. God forgives her. God will help her. She's at a very critical time in her life. It could easily go the opposite direction. This this mistake, this problem, this very deep hurt could be used to motivate her to have a stronger life and a better life. Or it could drive her further and further away. 
mom and dad and teenage son, they need to have a heart-to-heart talk, don't they? They need to understand the value of what life is really about. It's not about cars. It's not about the things that we want. It's about living a good life and being thankful for what you have. And Sam and his family, they have a long hole to climb out of, but they can do it. We can all do it. If God shows us that he's with us and that we know we have each other, which is why James says, be patient, brothers and sisters. Be patient, be strong, persevere, hold on, don't give up, stay together. The Lord is coming. And that's a message Nolansville Community Church needs to hear today. We need to hear it. We need to not only hear it, we need to believe it. We need to buy into it, right? We need to see that our lives, too, they matter before God. That that God, God hears us. God knows us. God loves us. That's why He gave us Jesus. His one and only Son, right? He gives us Jesus to help us. Bring us back. Help us go forward. I know that there's probably a few secrets still buried at 746 Brook Hollow Road. Mom and Dad didn't find them all. Not yet. But I also know that I have no secrets from God. He knows everything about me. He knows everything about you too. And He cares about us. He loves us. He loved James' church. He loves this church. He wants to help us. Are we willing to receive His help? Are we willing to say, you know, you're right, God. You're right. I I don't need to place so much value in what distracts me right now. I need to begin to see a little more clearly. I need to begin to live a little more fully. You're right, God. You're right. You're right. And when we do that, we have something. We have faith. We have faith that is at work. Faith at work. God knows. God hears. Do we follow Him? Amen.